All right, so today we're gonna talk all about plastic surgery. Where are the scars going? Best places to go get plastic surgery. Best is does it change my perception when I'm dating somebody? I had women schedule consultations from jail. Hey everyone, I'm Morgan Debon, a passionate entrepreneur and life advisor. With the Journey Podcast, you'll discover that success isn't about the destination, it's about the journey. I'm sharing stories of amazing people who've taken control of their lives. Join me on my own journey to discover the secret sauce behind reaching success with permission from no one else. Before we get into the episode today, I would like to remind you to subscribe to the podcast. I see you all are listening to the episodes and I love that and I'm so grateful for you and I appreciate all of your amazing reviews, but please, please, please also subscribe because it really helps us in the algorithm. So that is my PSA today. All right. So today we're going to talk all about plastic surgery. I know. So excited. I asked all the girls to give me all their questions. Good. And good. guys. Okay. So we're going to get into the trendy things that are going on, the stuff that's like old news, get into maybe a couple of your botch stories just yeah. because I love the tea. Oh, yeah. And then also just talk a little bit of, about your journey, right. you know, navigating, becoming a doctor and all the things that you want to do with your life. Right, right. So let's get into it. Let's get into it. So first things first, you're from Alabama. I am. I'm from Huntsville, Alabama. Actually, a small town called Triana. Population's like, last time I checked Wikipedia, like around 1,000 poor rural black community wow and we moved into huntsville proper probably right when i was in middle school and that was like a culture shock for me because mm -hmm. you know it was like southern county so you know it's predominantly white mm -hmm. and then i was in an inner city like high school and middle school so it was totally different I was like, oh it's a lot more of me it's like oh you know it's just it's totally different but i wound up loving it and i think it really shaped me for who i am today like being able to navigate and things like that mm -hmm. so Stuff. There's probably not a lot of plastic surgeons in Huntsville, Alabama, though. No, no. I I mean, I see the billboards now because, you know, it's like I'm keen to it, but there's not a lot of plastic surgeons, you know, across the country. It's a mm. very small specialty. Everybody kind of knows everybody. And then the subset of, like, black plastic surgeons, it's almost like a unicorn, like almost like one per city or maybe wow. one per state or something like that. I did look up in Nashville. I was like... I wonder who the plastic surgeons, there's actually, I couldn't find one. Yeah. Do you know any that are here in the I know my mentor when I was in med school, Jason Wendell, he was with Vanderbilt. Mm. I think he may be completely private practice now. Mm. And then the division chair was Bruce Shack at the time. He's are academics though. Yeah, I'm like, exactly. nah, I'm I think, not I think he's retired. Academics. No, so I think Jason <laughs> Wendell's probably the only person I know yeah. that practices here in Nashville. Crazy. Yeah, no, it's a rare thing. So we're sitting with a unicorn. <laughs> All right, so how did you go from rural Alabama to the king of Miami, uh, <laughs> living a fast life, BBLs every day? Right, like, right. That feels like a giant leap. It was. So, I mean, it was like a gradual thing. I went to med school. I thought I wanted to be a neurosurgeon. I had read Ooh. all these books, Keith Black, a Gifted Hands by Ben Carson. Mm -hmm. I thought that's what I wanted to do. I didn't like it. It didn't fit my personality. I didn't like the procedures. And so I thought about dermatology. So my mom's mom, you know, my maternal grandmother had melanoma, which is rare mm -hmm. in the black community. And so that kind of piqued my interest. So I applied through the American Academy of Dermatology, got this mentorship for a month. Mm -hmm. Meharry allowed me to do that mentorship because I was only a second year. You really mm -hmm. don't you went need to stuff. You Meharry like, Medical School. Yep, here in Nashville because my mom, I'll get into that. Mm -hmm. But uh, I did this one month internship, which is rare because you usually have to be a third or fourth year to do something like this. And they gave me permission. And I loved it, but I liked the surgery part of it more. Mm. And so one of the residents was like, well, you should check out plastics. And so I did a two-week rotation on plastics as a third year, loved it. And then I did some away rotations where it was just a month-long rotation, only doing plastic surgery stuff. Hmm. I did it at the University of Kentucky, and I did it at Vanderbilt. Mm -hmm. And went to residency, I loved it, thought I was going to be a pediatric plastic surgeon, doing cleft lip, palate, mm -hmm. you know, children with deformities, but I didn't like those procedures. And I don't like to yeah. see kids hurt. And I yeah. love kids. I, I mean, I love them. And so I was just going to be like a general plastic surgeon, doing some reconstruction, doing some cosmetics. So I worked in a rural hospital system in Ohio. I love that hospital. I mean, the staff were great. And the only reason I left was because I just wanted to be closer to home. If I could move that hospital, I'd still be there doing the same stuff. Right. And my practice was like 50-50, reconstruction and cosmetics. Wait, and can you explain what reconstruction is? So, yeah, so... A lot of people think of plastic surgery just being more aesthetic stuff like, you know, tummy tucks, breast augmentations, things like that. 
But uh, it's actually a bigger field in reconstruction. So like skin cancer, when people like, you know, have real bad skin cancers mm. and they have to be cut off, you can't just close that tissue together and create a straight line. You got to rotate tissue in, bring in tissue from other places. Mm. Or if somebody uh, is in a bad car accident, you know, and they break their bone, but that bone tears the skin at the same time, mm -hmm. you can't just close that skin up. You got to move tissue from somewhere else mm. or bad burns, bad burn reconstruction. So that's kind of like what we call reconstruction. Okay. Um, and so I was doing a lot of that, did a lot of it in residency. So I left and came down to Miami. <laughs> and uh, From Ohio? From Ohio. Another culture shock. But I was ready for it because I, you know, been from a small town in Alabama that I moved to Tampa, which is, you know, mid-sized city. Right. And I was in Nashville. But, you know, I never saw myself living in Miami. Like, I had visited Miami and I was like, I could never live here. You are so Miami now. I don't I, know. I am, man. <laughs> Yeah, I'll sign a little bit. I, I, I'm a Miami boy, you know. <laughs> but I, I love it now. The plan is to put down roots. I've been there almost three years now. Wow. Almost three years. And, you know, I love what I do. The expectations are a lot higher, though. You know, mm. even from, like, doing cosmetic surgery in different cities. In Miami, it's like they want to look like, you know, the face app. Or they want to look like they've had makeup done or like mm -hmm. it's been edited. And so, you know, you have to have some real deep conversations to like, hey, let's be real now. You know, you're not a robot. This, is a, this, <laughs> this isn't is Photoshop. Exactly. This is not real. But we're going to get you as close as we can there, you know. Yeah. So that's how I made it to Miami, though. Fascinating. Yeah. Okay. So you said you did a stop in Tampa. Mm -hmm. So now I should know this because my dad's a doctor, my brother's a doctor, but mm -hmm. it's med school, residency, mm -hmm. and then. You can do a fellowship depending on what you want to do. So okay. I didn't need to do a fellowship. So I went straight into practice after residency. Okay. And that's where I did my residency was okay. in Tampa. Got it. And then you said, I need to make money now. Mm. I'm going to Miami. Yeah, exactly. I wanted to be closer to home and yeah. I wanted to make more. That's what brought me to Miami. I love it. All right. So walk me through what you do. Do you do surgeries every day? I do. I do consultations and surgeries all day, every day, Monday so through Friday. How many surgeries would you do in like a normal day? Usually like five or six. It depends. That's a lot. Yeah. I'm like, I'm young. I'm going to knock them out now. But uh, like a breast augmentation doesn't take me that long. You know, at most 45 minutes to do a breast augmentation. Really? The fastest one I've done is probably like 24 minutes. Skin to skin, as we say. Whoa. Okay. Wait, 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 wait. 45 minutes for new to taste? Yeah. That's yeah, as long as I'm not having to lift them or do anything extra, we're just putting in implants. It's a quick procedure. And for the person who's getting the procedure... That means it's like a half day. You're in and you're mm -hmm. out. Yep, exactly. They're probably home within two to three hours after recovery and stuff like that. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So let's walk through. These are the questions I got. You know, I right. took questions from the audience. Okay. If you guys ever want to submit questions to me, you can always DM me on Instagram or DM the podcast. But basically, I asked people, what kind of questions do you have for Dr. Trix? Number one question was first, just like, what are the actual steps? I think there's a lot of people who, like, they implicitly know that a lot of folks in the world are getting plastic surgery. Mm -hmm. It's becoming more and more popular right, right. for the everyday person, yeah, not, not just a yeah. L.A. celebrity, you know. But it feels overwhelming, yeah. and it's not something that people talk about openly a lot. Right. So if I'm like, I would like to have my boots done, what are the steps that I should take then? What happens next? Right. I think, one, make sure that you're healthy. Okay. You know, you're eating right. Like... Your BMI or basically your weight is under control. If you're on any medications for anything, you know, check with your primary care doctor and have that conversation with them too. But hey, I'm thinking about getting, you know, cosmetic surgery, thinking about getting my breasts done. Do you think I'm a good candidate from just, you know, overall health standpoint? Okay. Because you're probably going to see them before you probably see me. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, you can start like looking at pictures and even just schedule a consultation. Most consultations are free. Some plastic surgeons do charge. I don't. And uh, we have a frank discussion. We look at your pictures. We talk about your expectations. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, it's kind of like, all right, well, I have all the information. Do I want to pull the trigger on this or not? Mm. But like, one, making sure you're healthy. And two, talking to, you know, the plastic surgeon you're thinking about handing your life to, essentially, yeah. are the biggest steps for sure. And on mood board. I heard you just say a mood yeah, board, a mood basically. Board. Yeah, basically look at pictures like this is the look I'm going for. Can I accomplish this? Some plastic surgeons hate that. Mm. I don't mind it because to me, it shows your expectations. So I kind of know what you're going for. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, sure, I'm like, no, we're not going to get there. Or I'm like, yeah, we can get you close to there. You know, mm. I can't promise it, but I think it's feasible. Because, you know, in the BBL realm, you know, I'm like, all right, so what are you shooting for? Oh, I want something more natural. They show me this picture. 
I'm like, that's not natural. <laughs> that's not natural at all. You know, I'm glad we had Wait, this discussion because so I would have made them natural and they would have been mad at me. So, do they really think that the picture they're showing you is a natural butt? Yeah, some of them do. Oh, I love that for them. Yeah, and I'm looking at them like, no, this is not natural. <laughs> this, this is, is like three procedures. Yeah, this is like three rounds of BBL wow. trying to get in the fat to stay in that area and, you know, come out with that look for wow. sure. Yeah. Fascinating. Okay, so <laughs> we're going to come back to BBLs because that's a whole segment on its own. So you first make sure you're healthy. Mm -hmm. BMI meaning, you know, you can't be incredibly overweight. Yeah, exactly. And then do you need your primary physician to sign off on this? No. Yeah, I, some plastic surgeons. For okay. me, you do. I want a medical clearance from your primary care doctor, meaning that, you know, all your laboratory work is with the normal range. All your medical conditions, if you have any, mm -hmm. are taken care of and stable. I think it's just, it's better to be safe than sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was in a hospital setting, unless that person was older or like a sicker person, then I would require, but now everybody gets a medical clearance. Because mm -hmm. what I've come to find out that younger people are having more medical problems than my older patients. Like my older patients may have like, you know, some high cholesterol or some high blood right. pressure, but it's all controlled. They're fine. My younger patients, I got some things going on. I'm like, I've only seen this in the textbook. Oh, really? Yeah. Like so high I, blood pressure? Or age? just just like some weird like blood clotting disorders oh, or really? things I've only like read in an article. And so I have to like send them back to their primary care doctor and they have to go to see specialists right. to make sure, you know, all that is taken care of. So I think it's a good practice because one, it may, you know, diagnose them with something that could potentially hurt them later down the road. We can yeah. get that taken care of ASAP because a lot of people, you know our age or younger aren't really going to the physician as much no. unless they absolutely need to. Yeah. And so this kind of like may bring up something that could potentially, you know, save them later. Yeah. I mean, we've all seen the news and the headlines of terrible stories mm -hmm. of people who die after getting plastic surgery right. or I haven't heard as many stories recently of people dying on the table, but mostly right. like within the next two weeks after. Yeah. Help us understand what are the kind of factors that are typically going to those cases. I'm sure y'all yeah. are all talking about it right. in your private. Oh yeah, for sure. Search and check. Yeah, or whatever. You're, but... you're all you're trying to avoid those. Uh, yeah. Most of the time, it's what we call venous thromboembolism, so blood clots essentially. Okay. So being under a general anesthesia increases your risk of blood clots because your veins aren't moving that blood as well. So that's why they put these squeezy things on you. That's why they have you wear these compression stocks or what we call TED hose. And then you want your patient up and moving around like ASAP. Like mm. that's the first thing I preach in consultation. Mm. And that's what I preach the day of surgery. And then they go home with instructions of like how often they need to be up and walking. Mm. Because just because you had surgery doesn't mean you just lay in a bed like the sick and shut in. I want you moving to try to get you back to your baseline yeah. as quick as possible. And so, you know, walking is the biggest thing you can do to prevent that. You can also give them a blood thinner mm -hmm. and make sure their kidney function as well because there's different types of blood thinner to help prevent that. But it's usually something in the realm of a blood clot. Mm. How does a blood clot kill you? So it travels from the veins of the legs and then it can travel up to the lungs. And so the lungs can't oxygenate the heart. And so that's when you basically have like a heart attack or something like that because mm. it stops the functioning because you're not delivering oxygen to the tissues. Or it can travel up to the brain and cause a stroke. Okay. And so, you know, those neurons aren't getting fresh oxygen to fire and things like that. Okay, not to be morbid, but I'm just like, how, what is it? No, no. So that's actually what got me into medicine. Oh, like you would hear like how people got sick and you're like, yeah. so what's going on in the body to cause these symptoms, either from a microscopic or more of a macroscopic or both level. Right. And so that's, that's how I got into medicine. If was you thinking like that. me, I would have said it's the anesthesia because people are always like going under, you're going right. under right. and they make the like, it's is it, am I awake? Rare. Yeah, yeah. And if I'm awake, then I'm not at risk. Yeah. That's like as an uneducated person. The, the thing about being awake is because those veins are able to still pump. And so the, the blood's moving like normal because mm. you're able to wiggle your legs and stuff like that. So that blood's pumping. So you decrease your chance of developing a blood clot. Mm. So that's why awake anesthesia is good. Like you can go under and be just fine. The only thing is. You know, you really got to have make sure you're pumping that blood. Got it. And, pe and some people, you know, especially us type A people, control freaks, it's not the surgery that scares us, it's the anesthesia. Right. And it's because you have to give up the ultimate control, yeah. which is your body. Yeah. Yeah. I'm one of those. <laughs> Would you ever get plastic surgery? Oh, have you had plastic surgery? I no, say. I've, had, I've had Botox. Yeah, I had my nurse Wait, give me Botox. Eyebrows. Oh, it's not recent. This is about a year ago. <laughs> Real wrinkled up up here. Might get a little vampire facial, you know, smooth the skin out. But uh, no, I'm not opposed to it. There's no procedure I could see myself really wanting unless I was to, like, gain a lot of weight and had a lot of loose skin. I wouldn't want that loose skin because it causes problems like rashes and stuff like that. So, yeah. Other than that, 
I don't think I would really do outside of just like medical spa stuff, Botox. See, and you just hear I was like, well, you know, outside of this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm not opposed to it. I'm just saying but right now, this. right now, this, this is what I'm thinking. Yeah, <laughs> but, but no, I see no problem with it. Like I have some men that come in because they don't like their ears are too big. Yeah, or so what are the things out. the men are getting? Oh, man. Calves. Calf implants, bicep implants. Or, Wait, bicep implants? Yeah, or fat transfer to the biceps or to these muscle groups. Yeah, they'll get lipo, will define like their chest and stuff like that. And then you can put fat in there to kind of bulk them up a little bit. Can you tell, like if you saw like two men standing next to each other and one of them had gotten work done, would you be able to tell? Could you I, spot yeah, it? I, I, I think depending on how good the surgeon is, it makes it a little bit more difficult because mm -hmm. there's a couple of guys that are like well known for this. And you look at them like, yo, that's good. But yeah, you, if they're not as good, you can definitely what tell. What about calves? You probably couldn't tell calves. No, no. What that's... about the scar? Where would the scar go? Uh, a lot of times they're just getting fat injected there. But uh, they do try to hide the scar like in the crease, what we call the popliteal crease right behind the kneecap. Mm. Try to hide it in there. So you got to be looking for it. Because some people heal really well. They have a scar, but that scar is like impermissible. So, mm. yeah. But yeah, and then men get a lot of like Botox fillers, things like eyelid yeah. surgery. Is what about chin men's. implants? Chin implants, yep. They get that strong, like, jawline. That's a big thing. A lot of them are starting with the fillers, but after a while, they're like, yo, I could have just had a chin implant, right. and my jawline would be nice. Uh, male neck lifts and face lifts is probably more common in, like, the 55 hmm. age range. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So I was on TikTok, okay. which is a terrible place to get medical <laughs> advice. <laughs> yeah, man, I've seen some videos. I'm like, that doesn't make any sense, no. And one of the trends that I was seeing was that people were advocating for getting a facelift actually in your early 40s, like starting younger mm -hmm. and getting a mini facelift, which I was like, I don't understand the logic of that. What are the kind of procedures or trends that you're just like, that doesn't actually make sense, you guys. Don't do that. I don't know about that mini facelift thing because I feel like if you get it early, when you get older and it starts to kind of droop or become totic again, you know, that's more scar tissue to deal with. And that's a harder facelift to do mm. versus just waiting to a point where you actually need it. But no, I haven't heard any other trends. I don't really be on TikTok like that. I'm more of an IG person. Fair. I'm I still an IG person. I wouldn't <laughs> want my surgeon on TikTok to be eight. Oh, I'm okay with that. Okay, so myth or trend then, Okay, you should start getting Botox in your 20s. You can. It definitely works. It does make those muscles more weak to where you don't develop as deep a wrinkle or as many wrinkles versus someone that doesn't. And I see, and I, I started seeing that when I was in residency. We were having like young girls, like 18 or 19, getting Botox. Wow. Yeah, because I'm like, yeah, I don't want any wrinkles. I want my face paralyzed. Snatched. Yeah, I want stiffed. No. no. Obviously, all my Botox is gone. That's one thing about being pregnant. You can't do yeah. anything. Mm -hmm. And so I was Googling. This is the other thing I looked on TikTok. TikTok is my new Google. You know, there's more searches on TikTok per day than Google now. That's crazy. Just say. The algorithm is just really good. Is it? <laughs> so I was searching. I was like, well, when after baby can I go and get Botox or fillers or whatever? Because I have an empty, have an empty face. I have a fresh face right now. I would say in like three months. Three months really? postpartum. Yeah. If I'm not breastfeeding then. Exactly. Because if you're breastfeeding, no, right? No, I wouldn't risk it. I don't know if it does transmit or is transmissible through the breast milk, but why even risk it? Yeah. Yeah. So y'all might see this for a couple more years here well, a couple more years, years. No, maybe not you. you're doing that no no <laughs> some people do that though no, i had a patient that breastfed so the baby was like four that's not i mean i appreciate that those women but it's not for me well i mean i haven't even started and i can tell you <laughs> <laughs> i will do at least a strong eight months to a year so he can eat real food yeah. anyways so okay Good to know. And then what about the scars? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I see is I was like, look at these celebrities. Mm -hmm. We look at these women who you, you're you like, I know Absolutely. you got something. Like mm -hmm. Drea, she just talked about the fact right. that she said she didn't get a BBL. She said she got butt shots. Mm -hmm. And in my head, I'm like, and she got, she's had her boobs done twice. Right. But I'm like, you were half naked in all of your swimsuit outfits right. because of mint swim and i've never seen a scar on your body yeah that's how you know you're a good plastic surgeon if you can hide the scars because that's what you tell them like i can't promise that it's scarless definitely can't do that there's yeah. no such thing as a scarless surgery what we do best than anything is to hide the scars right you put them in different places to where when you take pictures 
or you're out and about, like you have to go searching for it. Mm -hmm. And so like when a lot of plastic surgeons do these like TikToks or IG videos on like celebrities and do I think they had this, that's what they're looking for. The typical places they would hide the scars. Same thing with BBL. Some people are really good in hiding them. Where are the scars going? Exactly. Tell me. Oh, so. I want to know. All right. So for breasts, you know, you can do it around the nipple. Uh, that oh, hides, here? Yep. Or in the armpit, or what we call the axilla. Okay. Slide the implant in, but it's hard to do silicone implants. They have to do saline because they pump them up like balloons to slide it into that. Oh. Uh, some people do it through the belly button to do uh, okay. breast implants. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Wait. You're putting in an implant? Up the belly button mm -hmm. all the way up. But it's a saline one because, you know, it's like a little I don't know bag. What that means. Saline implant, you pump it full of saline to blow it up versus a, a silicone, which is already like a whole breast implant. The okay. only way to put that in is either through the nipple or underneath the breast. So then why wouldn't everyone get saline? Some people don't like the look of saline implants because when you bend over, they wrinkle a little bit more. So you can go, oh, those ripples on the side of her breast. Mm. People don't like when they get cold sometimes and they go into the warm area, they, their breasts still feel cold because the saline has gotten cold. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they're not as soft as the silicone. It's squishy. Exactly. But then you'd have no scars. That's true. You know, these are the things you ask in consultations. You weigh the. I wouldn't even know to ask want. these questions. Yeah, yeah. To me. <laughs> That's why I think the pictures kind of help. Like you show your expectations and then the plastic surgeon can talk about, all right, this is how I typically do this procedure. This is where your scars would be and stuff like that. Okay. And then a BBL is a Brazilian butt lift. Mm -hmm. And what does that entail? So it's liposuction. So we take fat mostly from the torso, so the belly or wherever else you want us to get fat from. Mm -hmm. And then we inject it in the subcutaneous space or the fat space of the butt in the hips to give it a nice round, you know, round mound or something like that. There yeah. we are. Exactly. Okay, and scarring? Scarring isn't bad. Like even if you put it in a noticeable spot, that skin usually heals pretty well unless mm -hmm. you are prone to developing like darker scars or keloids or something like that. But those mm -hmm. are usually hard to find. And most women, when they pose, they edit them out anywhere. <laughs> you know, they just do, do, that little, do that little smear, little smear thing and boom, Gone. smooth. But in real life, they still heal pretty well to okay. where you don't see them as much. But some people are good at hiding them. Like you put one in the cleft, you know, mm -hmm. where the cheeks are yep. underneath the cheeks, right where it kind of hangs. Yep. And it's hard Under to the find booty. those. Yeah. You got to be looking for them. You got to be like on the person. To Which see is like, honestly, at that exactly. point. <laughs> exactly. So they hide pretty well. Okay. We have a question from the audience, which is, we're seeing a lot of women take out their breasts implants and you know maybe they got them 10 years ago mm -hmm. you know they're in their late 30s early 40s now and they're like i did this in my 20s and then you see them take them out and then they say you know my skin got so much better yeah. my yeah. this got so much better myth or fact so right now in the literature they're calling it breast implant disease or something like that uh, the FDA has shown no causation for those symptoms through the studies that like breast implants are actually causing these problems like autoimmune type diseases and things like that. But I mean, I know people personally that had implants, loved them, didn't want to get rid of them, but just were just like always tired, like sad, having skin mm. problems and things like that. And so they had them removed and they said all those things went away. Wow. So it's something going on. The, the literature just hasn't really shown that that's what's causing it and how it's causing it. Yeah. But the, the, some of the options are a lot of people are starting to do fat grafting to the breast. So the same concept of a Brazilian butt lift, except for the breast. Mm -hmm. But, you know, just like one of the risks of a BBL, all the fat doesn't stay alive. Mm -hmm. Some of it, you know, gets eaten away from the body. And so you could wind up with some asymmetry. One one breast, the fat takes. The one breast, the fat doesn't take as much. And so you wind up being a little Lops, asymmetric, a little lopsided. lopsided. And that's only, real life. Yeah, exactly. You know, breasts are usually one's bigger than the other. More, some are like sisters, some are more like cousins. Yeah. And so uh, the only way to fix that is to kind of redo the surgery, put more fat in that one side. Wow. But a lot of surgeons are starting to do that now, taking out breast implants from women mm. that are, you know, having issues, just don't want them anymore and doing fat grafting or some type of breast lift, or mm -hmm. we call a mastopexy to kind of still give them that result that they want. But that's usually the biggest thing you could do is to fat graft the breast. Mm. And when I see people who've taken their their boobs out mm -hmm. and they have all this like hard stuff around right. it what is that so that's uh the scar tissue so anytime you put something foreign in the body it's going to form a scar around it mm -hmm. sometimes the scar tissue gets so strong that's when we call it a contracture and it actually causes pain and there's different types of contracture like to the point where you can tell by looking at them or you know you can't tell but it still hurts and so 
when you take that implant out, you take out that scar capsule so things can heal and cause less pain or whatnot. But yeah, it's just mm-hmm. your own scar tissue causing that problem. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we have saline, silicone, yeah. any other types? No, so there's, with silicone, there's what we call the gummy bear, where like if you bite into a gummy bear, you know, it doesn't just leak out everywhere. And yeah. so a lot of people will like that, that get silicone implants, because back in the day, if that silicone implant broke, it would just kind of ooze, you know, out and people worry about it getting in the bloodstream and things like that. But now with the new technology, it stays together. So mm-hmm. you could slice these implants in half and they just two separate implants. Mm-hmm. And so they're a little bit more expensive. Saline, of course, is cheaper, but um, a lot of people like it. And that's mostly what I do. A lot of uh, gummy bear implants. Every once in a while, I get a saline. But if you're under 22, you can only have saline implants per the FDA. So much information. <laughs> I'm like, okay, got it. Scars under the boob, on the nipple. Mm-hmm. Got it. BBL scars on the back. Just stomach. Yeah. Yep. Right around, like, you know, right Pelvic above bone. the vagina and stuff like that. Yep. There's a new trend now with men called the, um, well, on- online called the DDL. You know, what is that? Fat graft into the penis. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, no. So, you know, some men are trying to, you know, make it, give it some more girth. Does it work? Yeah. How does that work, though? You got to be careful in where you're injecting the fat. It increases the girth. Sometimes by increasing the girth, it gives you just a little bit more length. But with length, you have to, like, there's a ligament you can cut to, they say that gives the illusion of it being a little bit longer. But mostly it just increases the girth. That just sounds so high risk. Yeah, that's why. <laughs> so I'm not doing it. It's, it's giving very high risk. Yeah, yeah. And so we get some more studies out there and some long term results. I'm yeah. just gonna stay away from that one. But it's a thing. Some people are doing it. Some people are doing it and getting good results with it. You know, I I hadn't seen them. I hadn't seen the results, but apparently they're out there and they, they, it's it's become more commonplace. Do you ever get desensitized because you look at so many naked bodies every day? Like, do you still obviously find women attractive, etc. But mm-hmm. like. Do you find yourself desensitized occasionally? Um, I think when I'm in work mode, it's work mode. I think okay. I'm very good at compartmentalizing. I think that's a, a strength of mine. So, like, if I'm in work mode, like, it's whatever. I'm like, oh, I got this going on. Or, oh, I'm on my cycle. Or, yeah, yeah. I was like, at this moment. I fine. see so many you know, <laughs> uh, in my In my personal life, no. Nah. It doesn't bother me. You're like, beautiful is beautiful. Exactly. They'll be like, because I guess the most common question I get is, does it change my perception when I'm dating somebody? Or am I looking for flaws or nothing? I'm like, no, if I'm on the clock, I'm on the clock. I'm not working with you. You know, (laughs) if I'm with you, I find you attractive and that's it. You know, I'm a man at the end of the day. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. These are the questions the girls need to know. (laughs) Do not slide in his DMs, ladies. (laughs) Do not. (laughs) Other question that came from the audience was, do you ever consider people's mental health? And I do. What does that look like? Or what's that kind of criteria? Yeah. For you? So as a plastic surgeon, a big thing I have to do is manage expectations. Mm-hmm. That's why, you know, I, I like them bringing in pictures to kind of see where they're at. Mm-hmm. You know, if they're on, you know, if they have some psychiatric issues, yeah. you know, I do make them get a clearance from their, uh, their psychiatrist to make sure that they're in a good mental state mm-hmm. to have surgery. And a lot of that is on my part, though, is when they come in for consultation, you know, talking to them and having that dialogue. That's why it's super important to have a plastic surgeon that's relatable or that's going to communicate and take their time with you. Mm. Because once I operate on you, I own you, you know, at that point. I have yeah. to make sure that you're good. So you're responsible for Yeah, it. exactly. And so having that consultation, talking to them, getting to know them and what their, their expectations are is a big thing. So, I mean, because I've canceled surgeries I've, or, you know, I've, I've decided not to operate on people that I felt like I couldn't deliver on what they wanted. Mm -hmm. Or if I felt like they have what's called BDD, body dysmorphic disorder, Mm. where, you know, you see some people out in social media that look like, who would do this? And those people usually have some mental component to where- Like unbotched, like on the TV show? Exactly. You see these people and I'm like, yo, I'm, I'm not- putting my stamp on you because people are going to ask like who operated on you say oh dr triggs I'm, well, I'm not going to that guy <laughs> and it clearly has no standards or morals and yeah. so that's a, that's a big thing so it really comes down to the consultation and talking with patients what percentage of people who are getting a bbl or um their boobs done are paying have a man paying for it man that's a good question 
I never pay attention to it unless they come into consultation. The they, men come into the consultation? Only if they invite them. Because I, I, I really prefer to just be them. But if they're like, if it's like a husband, they'll be like, oh, can my husband come? Because he has some questions and things like that. That's I have no problem why. with talking with them. Yeah. But, you know, there are some red flags that I have to look for. Like, you know, if she seems uncomfortable mm. or if he's more pushy mm. than she is or, you know, he's bringing up stuff that she's not even concerned about then that's those are the red flags I'm looking for. Mm. But uh yeah, definitely the husbands are flipping the bill. That like, yeah, this is this is my gift. And say so they come in so hype yeah. about it. <laughs> and, and and you know what's funny? A lot of times the husbands don't even want them to get anything. Really? They they're actually kind of upset that they're getting plastic surgery. Really? Boyfriends too. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It's it's I, I thought it would be the other way around. No, but no, most of the time they're they're kind of like women are getting it for them. Exactly. That's how you And feel. they're kind of like, you don't need anything. You're fine. Yeah. Yeah. So that's usually the trend. You would think they're pushy, but they're not. Yeah. And and that's also kind of a thing, too. So like if I see someone that's like, yeah, get the surgery done, then I'm kind of I have to kind of like turn in my radar a little bit more because it's more common for them not for them to have for the surgery. men to not want yeah, them. So if, exactly. the, if the man's like, this is what we're doing, mm -hmm. then it's like, all right, all right what's going on here? Come on. Right yeah, on. yeah. Yeah. Exactly interesting yeah. see i would have thought you would have said i mean like miami i'm mm -hmm. like all these, these girls are sponsored right right but you see more of just the women are like mm -hmm. this is what i want to do exactly interesting now what season is the most busy for you if i had to guess it'd be tax season man refund what? season that, <laughs> high season as we call it, it is <laughs> true like january we start like booking up real heavy and then like mid-february man and people are coming in and i mean they're like droves like i'm trying to get my surgery in in march because they're trying to have summer. a hot girl summer. Yeah, you mix tax season plus summer. Exactly. It's like, all right, I can get through the winter. Exactly. June, July starts to slow down a little bit. You know why? Because everybody's outside. Yeah, you're you not know, trying to they, be laid They're up trying to recover. Exactly. Or well, I guess you're not in the hospital. No, you're no. Home. They usually go home. And then back to school time, it slows down again because, okay. you know, they got switched to being mommies and going yeah. back to work and things like that. And then probably around now, it's starting to pick back up again. Because people can just chill for the holidays. Exactly. And get surgery, you know, before Thanksgiving or before Christmas so they have more time to recover. When I'm trying to go on vacation, <laughs> I'm trying to hang out with my family. Yeah. But yeah, definitely tax season. Okay. It gets crazy. All right. Good to know. Mm -hmm. Do you give discounts in low seasons? I do. I do like flash sales and things like that. Things booked and busy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have to be there anyway. Exactly. I only do it for like. Uh, usually more on breast augmentations. Those are quicker procedures, lower risk surgeries, things like that. The more riskier the surgery or, you know, more complication rates, then those surgeries I don't really put on sale. What is the riskiest surgery? High BMI, BBL? Mm -hmm. Yep, okay. BBLs. And the reason being is because there's the risk of blood clots and there's also the risk of if you're putting a fat in the wrong place, then that fat instead of that blood clot is traveling to the heart and to the lungs. Mm. When you hear about someone dying from a BBL, that's usually what happens is it's usually a, what we call a fat embolism, a piece of fat that moves into the heart and lungs and mm. blocks the, the blood from oxygenating. High risk. Very high risk. Okay. But the law is that you have to inject above the muscle because those vessels are in the muscle and deep to the muscle. So if you stay in that fatty plane, or we call it the subcutaneous plane, then you don't have any issues. It's giving doctor talk. Okay. <laughs> so outside of the U.S., mm -hmm. myth or fact, Dominican Republic, Colombia, best places to go get plastic surgery. That's, or that's, Turkey, I feel like, is popping up yeah, more Yeah, Turkey recently. is really good for face, like rhinoplasty, uh, face lifts, uh, mid-face lifts, and hair transplant. That's kind of what they're known for in the plastic surgery community. And they're, I mean, they have some good results. I can't argue. I've, I've seen some, some, uh, some nose jobs, and I'm like, that's impressive. And they have like really good surgeons out there because a lot of them come and speak at our conferences. Uh, same thing with Colombia, Brazil, and in the Dominican Republic. Their laws are different from us because it's based on state laws for us. But in those countries, they can be a little bit more aggressive. They can take more fat mm. or, you know, they have to stay in a hospital. So, you know, they can they can be a little bit more aggressive with their surgeries. And that's what, you know, some of them want because they want a more exaggerated look. Mm. The only thing is you have no legal rights out there. So if something goes wrong. You know, that's what you have to deal with. Here, we, we you know, we're a lot more safer. Uh, we we have a higher moral code and ethical code. You know, some yeah. some surgeons out here break that and they pay the pay the price for it. But if you go out there, you're at their determination. But they have just as good as surgeons as we. Sometimes better in different things because mm. they come and speak at our conferences and they teach us. So, mm. yeah. Okay, so if you're gonna go abroad, then it sounds like the advice might be pick someone who 
It's reputable. Is reputable. Yes. And also pick someone who is teaching yeah. and is like part of the, exactly. you know, just the make organizations. sure. Exactly. Yeah. I think another thing you can do is just definitely have something set up to where you can recover. Because mm -hmm. a lot of times they won't let you leave the country. They, you have to um, sign away that right until you kind of healed up. Because some wow. people try to come in and out. And the thing is, they're just as expensive, if not more expensive than us. So people oh, like really? think they're going for something cheap. If they're good, they're not going to be cheap. Really? So that's a, that's another flag you got to look at. Yeah. I would have not thought that. Yeah. I mean, my assumption is that the girls are going down there because it's half the price. Yeah. They, it used to be, but now those guys are so good, and because of social media, they're just as um, just as popular as some of the mm. U.S. surgeons. They raise their prices too. And you're international, exactly. so like now you're. I mean, you know, yeah. you get two weeks, three weeks. Yeah, but they're they're just as safe. The reputable ones now. Yeah, I don't, but yeah, uh, we're not yeah. talking about the ones in yeah, the motels. Yeah, the yeah, yeah, exactly. We're not talking about exactly. those people. Okay, question from the audience, which is: We've heard about men getting these um, heightening like procedures right. where they can grow like three to five inches. What does that entail? So they're putting like these external fixators on legs. So like if you have like a really bad broken bone where it just didn't come together as easy, they're almost like piece, you know, different pieces. Yeah. Uh, they put these external fixators on. So it's like a cage that holds the bone in different places. And they're doing that. They're like basically sawing the bone. Inside your bone. Yeah. Yeah. They're sawing the bone and, you know, makes you a little bit taller. So it works. It works, yeah. Some orthopedic surgeons are doing, I think it's like 200,000, 180,000 to 200,000. Whoa. Now, see, so we didn't talk prices, but I was going there next. Yeah, yeah. That's nuts. Yeah, and it's working. I don't know in high demand, pun intended, <laughs> high demand <laughs> it is, but because of the price, but yeah, uh, you've seen some success stories, at least I've seen like in social media and the news, yeah. Mostly orthopedic surgeons. I mean, I've seen some interviews of guys being like, yeah, it was worth it, though. Yeah. Like, I feel mm -hmm. like women take me more seriously. Yeah. I feel like I get advanced in my career. And I've actually seen the studies that show that men that are over six feet, like how much it actually does impact mm. their average wages and all types of stuff. Even presidents. Yeah, I knew about the president one, but yeah. I didn't know about the, the career one. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Like, if you look at the average height of, like, CEOs, mm -hmm. it's, like, it's not 4'11", that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> you would be a great CEO, statistically speaking. We're, we're working on it. <laughs> we're building I love it. Okay, someone said my hairline is getting a little thin. What's the tea on hair transplants for men? Do I need to fly to Istanbul? Well, not necessarily. I have a good friend that does hair transplant. He's out in Beverly Hills, okay. the Crown Institute, and they're doing really good work. There's some PRP treatments where they take your own blood, they spin it down, and then they inject it in these areas where you have like patches or things like that. And that's been shown to work as well, too. Some dermatologists do it, but I know the Crown Institute personally, Dr. Robert Drummond and Dr. Truesdale, who's a facial plastic surgeon out in mm -hmm. Beverly Hills. They have an institute where they're doing like really good work, especially in people of color. Yes. Okay. So non-surgical body contouring. Mm -hmm. So like, I guess, cool sculpting and some other things versus surgery for diastasis recti. Yeah. Post pregnancy what's your perspective so with diastasis recti that's when yeah see abs... i can't even did you hear yeah. that that was a really polite way of being like girl you don't know what you're talking about no no you know what you're talking about <laughs> that's when the ab muscles get separated either through like massive weight gain or usually more than common the babies they push those ab muscles back and you know sometimes they come back a little bit but they're never as straight as they were you know uh prepartum and uh, the only way to really fix that is a tummy tuck because you have to be in there, you have to sew those ab muscles together. So there's mm -hmm. no correcting it. Of course, there's going to be some company out there that's going to try to, oh, if you wear this type of waist trainer, or you do this, that, and the other, that will bring your abs together. No, it's false. In other words, there is no replacement for surgery for, exactly. for that. You can do like almost like a mini tuck um, to try to get to get to the area to actually do the sewing. To sew What's the abs a mini together. tummy tuck? It's not. It's just a short scar tummy tuck. Like the size of like a C-section mm -hmm. scar? Exactly. How so, long is a tummy tuck scar? Hip to hip bone. That's the standard. How are these people hiding that? I don't understand. Tattoos. They're actually tattooing um, like the scar, not necessarily like getting like a floral type tattoo, but like color match to okay. try to hard it. Yeah. That's what okay. a lot of people are doing. Uh, we came out of breast reconstruction. Like we would tattoo nipples and mm. tattoo the scars. They're doing it for these tummy tuck scars to better camouflage. And just some people heal super nice. No, but black people don't. You know, it's tougher for us. Yeah. It's mm -mm. tougher, but there are some like, people I that I have a heal. scratch right here. It's going to be a scar for a scratch. Like, okay. So but, um, tummy tucks are from here to here. Mm -hmm. And 
I also heard that people could get them underneath. Yeah, they can do a reverse abdominal plaster, a reverse tummy tuck, where they hide the scar underneath the breast. Hmm. But it just depends on where the skin is loose. If the skin is loose lower, then you need to have a lower, what we call a traditional uh, tummy tuck or abdominal plasty. If the skin's more loose, like higher, then you can you can you know pull that skin up and hide the the scar underneath the breast. Mm. Mm -hmm. So can people just get a tummy tuck? So tummy tuck is lipo and like do you move fat and you? Uh, yeah, most pl most people will do like a little bit of lipo on the sides when they do their tummy tuck, just to give it a, a more smoother and uh, better aesthetic look. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Okay, okay, all right. I think I got that answer. In other words, the answer to your question is. No, body contouring, non-surgical versus yeah, surgical. Yeah, for, for dissect, for that. that. Yeah, you have to go under the knife. Okay, so breastfeeding after two babies, your boobs have drooped, mm -hmm. etc. Is there a way to lift it without you like having to get stuff in it? I mean, you can do a lift without using implants, but once they become that totic, that stretched out, the only way to fix it is with surgery, unfortunately. Are the girls coming in to get things done vaginally? Yeah. What are yeah, those things? Yeah. So we can get uh, do labiaplasty. Okay. Um, you know, that's when like, you know, the skin of the labia majora minora, it's like a little bit longer, you yeah. know, and they want, you know, to have it nice and prettier. Mm -hmm. uh, we do that. And it's usually a pretty quick procedure, but that is also a procedure that you can really mess up. So you need to know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And then some people are getting like PRP injections to that area and enhances their orgasms. They say it Why? tightens things blood. and it makes things. Yeah, your own blood, stem cells going down there. And they say the men really enjoy it. I'm sure These are real. It's real things. These are real things that are happening out here. <laughs> real things. Fascinating. <laughs> so the girls are losing weight fast. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then it feels like, particularly when you look at like the Kardashians and some of these other like celebrities, they're still maintaining their curves and stuff. Mm -hmm. So do you think, are people like losing weight and then coming in and then puffing it back up? Or how yeah. does this happen? I think, I think a lot of times, yeah, they're dropping weight. And at the same time, if they're like any like dips, like in their hips or something like that, and they want to be rounder. I think a lot of them are doing maybe sculpture, some of the like um, non-fat injectables, because then you can hide those scars because it's really just a needle. Um, to try to fill things out. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of people are jumping on like the the weight loss drugs. Mm. And but they they have their side effects. I've I've known people that were like like sick, sick, like, mm. you know, at home or whatever, but a lot of GI distress. But they they work. It's it was built to be a diabetic drug. And right. they noticed like the massive changes in weight. But yeah, definitely if you're gonna be on it, read about the side effects, have a consultation with whoever's prescribing it. It works, but I mean, there are some bad side effects to it, so you have to be careful with it. And you can't have surgery when you're on Exactly, because, you know, before you have surgery, you have to be what we call NPO, nothing by mouth, for at least like eight hours or so before surgery. Mm -hmm. The way these drugs work, they make you feel full longer. There's food still kind of like sitting in you. And so, you know, you can run into like aspiration risk with the anesthesia because you still have like technically food particles or whatever in your GI system that need to be out. So four weeks to kind of get it out of your system. And mm. I think it's what most surgeons are doing two to four weeks, unless it's like a critical procedure, then, you know, mm -hmm. it can still happen. Yeah. It's just all the things that we all do. It's just so overwhelming. It's like, you take this drug to lose weight and then mm -hmm. you take the fat from over here, but you put it back in. And yeah. like, it's just, do you ever get like, guys, this is enough. Like, yeah. I, I mean, I've had patients that come in and I'm like, I literally see nothing wrong with you. And I feel like if I operate on you, um, I'm not going to meet your expectation because I feel like I can mess it up because I've like, you look great. Yeah. And so those are the ones, you know, you got to have that conversation with them. I'm not just doing it just to do it. Like, you know, there's risk in everything, even if it is a routine procedure. Mm -hmm. And so if the risk outweighs the benefit, like, and then with the fads and the trends and because of social media, plastic surgery is still taking off. It's yeah. not as taboo no more. People actually talk about plastic surgery. It also feels more affordable. Yeah, like exactly. I thought some of these procedures would cost, I mean, minus the length, length anyone, but like lipo is right. like what, less than 10K now? Yeah. Oh yeah, less than five. What? Yeah. Less than 5K for lipo? Yeah. Shoot, the personal trainer costs more than that. Exactly. <laughs> Come see me. <laughs> <laughs> but no, like, uh, it's very, like, mainstream now. Like, there are surgery groups on Facebook that mm. talk about different surgeons, what they're good at, you know, complications they've heard and things like that. Like, there's surgery communities 
that talk about plastic surgery to come up with like, you know, oh, buy this or take these supplements and things like that to help you through the recovery process and post-op process. Mm. So, you know, back in the day, like maybe the 90s, plastic surgery was like hush, hush. Like, oh, I think she had work done. Mm -hmm. Now it's like, oh, yeah, I got a BBL. <laughs> you know, they, they, they stunt that. Like I have followers, they call themselves dolls, like Triggs dolls and things like that, people that I've operated on. And it's, they Wait. just have a strict surgery Instagram page. Wait. You have people who call themselves Triggs dolls? Yeah. Yeah. I love that for you. Yeah, they'll put like their BMI and their like little bio, or their their They're IG, proud. what uh what surgery they had done. They'll put their po their pre-op, post-op pictures, their recovery process. Yeah, they almost like a blog of their surgery. Wow. And they'll call it like Dr. Triggs doll 2023 or soon to be Dr. Triggs doll. And wow. Oh. Or Dr. Triggs' masterpiece. Because yeah. it's like a part of their identity. Yeah. How does that make you feel? I don't know, man. Sometimes it makes me feel uncomfortable. <laughs> Not that I lot to you. But um, no, I mean, if it's all up to them. Like, Are you going to get a trademark for that? No, no. I mean, the only thing I like, I used to hate this term, triggified, but it's grown on me. It's, gr I've it's definitely I've seen your marketing on... materials. Yeah. You like it. Yeah, I, yeah, I've grown to like it. <laughs> so this comes out with these videos, I'm like, what are we doing? Yeah, yeah it's Shout out to your marketing team. It does yeah, work. Yeah. I love my patients, though. I have some good girls. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. So good. How many people per month come in that are actually pregnant? Oh, for me, that come in and find out they're pregnant? Yeah. Oh, man. I get, like, maybe once a week. What the week? They'll come in and they'll do their pregnancy tests because usually they'll have a pregnancy test with their normal labs within 30 days. But we always test them the day of surgery, too, sure. or, the, or the day before surgery. And we've had some patients, like, find out they were pregnant the day before surgery. How do you even tell some patients? I'm like, like we're going to ca we're gonna have to cancel your surgery. Um, they're technically pregnant. A lot of times they don't want to believe it, so they'll go... And they'll take a, you know, at-home kit course. and then it winds up being positive. And then they got to go see their, their ob and have whatever conversation they need to have. Terrible. But yeah, about once a week, though. It, yeah, about That's once a, a week. lot. One, about once a week. Okay, now we got to get into it. <laughs> what are the other really random things that you've seen where oh, you're like, man. this is not really my job? But right. y'all are out here doing the most. Yeah, I got some crazy stories. I've had, I've had women schedule consultations from jail or prison. <laughs> From the, like, the, you know, the, the, the contraband phone, they'll send in pictures and we're like, yo, are those bars? She's like, I'm about to get out. I'm ready. Trying to get, trying to get on the schedule. I, but do you, do you take the consultation? I mean, yes. yeah, I mean, she's <laughs> like, this is, it's a free consultation and I, you know, I can't be out here, like, not living up to my word. Like, we give them that, you know, we talk to them through their contraband prison phone. <laughs> and, uh, man I of the mean, people. There's, there's, there's some things women like still having, uh, pieces of like bullet fragments, you know, in their butt and they want to get a, B a BBL and I'm like, yo, I don't, I don't want to do that. Cause I don't know where these fragments might land or whatever, Wrong doctor. stuff like that. You can't make this stuff up. <laughs> like that, that prison phone one really took me for a loop. That's, and that was like over a year ago when she was scheduling the consultation. Oh my gosh, that's a good one. So you know, I have I have patients send in and photos uh, for their for their consultation, of, and you know, some of these photos are um, they're they're promiscuous. I know they're, not, I'm like not a sexy photo for Doctor Triggs with lingerie on and all of that. This I'm like, we're supposed we're to be here. talking about your breasts, but you bent over is not where we're trying to go with this. You not know, okay. It's a, it's 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 some, it's some different people. Out here. How many people come into consults just to hit on you? Probably about five or six. That's so like one many. a day, one a day, or after surgery, they'll be trying to like come in more frequently. And I always have a chaperone. I don't play about that. Like there's someone in the you room have with me. To. Yeah, I, I have to protect myself. And uh, door open policy. Exactly. And yeah, they like, oh, um, we should, you know, try to go out for drinks or something like that. Yeah, it's, it's it's a wild world out here. And then what happens when they see you out in public? Are people like? shy or like, uh, no hey. they come up so last saturday i was at this birthday party and so i was like hey dr Triggs," and you know i take pictures i get noticed the most though at airports oh fascinating yeah like i'll have my twins with me uh -huh. and they're like oh it's dr Triggs," and it's like i can't get a photo i'm like okay <laughs> you know but uh <laughs> it's crazy or i'll be on family vacation we'll be at the outlet malls in orlando right. i'm like i'll see you on uh, instagram i think the the craziest thing for me my dad was coming in town and I went to Target to uh, get some snacks and stuff for us to uh -huh. chill out, to watch the games. It was these girls, you could tell they were from New York because they had the accent. And they were like, they kept looking at me and they were like, 
I've seen you on TikTok. You're that surgeon from TikTok. <laughs> and they were visiting Miami. And I was just like, yo, this is so crazy. You're an Insta-famous doctor. Just I love so that for so you. So do crazy. your kids know what you do? Uh, Yeah, they do. Okay. They think Instagram is TV. So they're like, I've seen daddy on TV. Oh, that's cute. Yeah. <laughs> and they like the TikTok. They don't have any TikToks of their own. Yeah. But uh, they're like, there's daddy. He's on TikTok. He's famous. <laughs> they, they, Well, my daughter loves it. But my, my son's just like, Daddy works at a gym. I'm like, you never see me in no gym outside Not of working. Not a gym. That. Right. Trying to play me. My son. But that's the type of relationship he has. I love he that. He like the joke on me. He'll keep you humble. Exactly. We had a lot of questions about this blood clot thing yeah. and the anesthesia. People are really terrified. Yeah. Yeah. It's rare to die from like actual anesthesia, like the anesthesia drug itself. Unless yeah. you got some like weird genetic abnormality and there's ways of treating that if that pops up. And they usually do a pretty good job of screening. So usually when someone dies from surgery, it's not because of the anesthesia. It's something, something else. That, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But obviously doctors can't talk about what that is. So there's no way for them to defend themselves. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, yeah. we see the news of some yeah. someone dying. That doctor can't say, well, actually, yeah. this person had this, yeah, this, 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 or mm -hmm. lied about their this. Exactly. Because legally you can't. Exactly. Cannot. And it's a stiff penalty if they were to break that. Yeah. The HIPAA law, I think it's like maximum or minimal $250,000 in like five years in jail. Like and your reputation. And your reputation. You know? So all yeah. they can do is just be quiet and just let the rumors run amok until, you it's know, terrible. the I information feel bad. comes out on its own. I feel bad for those doctors sometimes. Yeah. I'm like... Yeah, you're getting ripped apart. Yeah, because sometimes I put myself in their place, like, yo, like I would feel sick to my stuff. Like when I hear about a death, especially in Miami or someone, yeah, I know it's close. Like it hurts me. I'm like, yo, man, like I wouldn't be able to sleep, like, because that's not why I'm in this business. No, like the money's not good enough to put people at risk like that, and I got to be able to sleep for myself. Yeah, so I have no problem canceling surgeries for like something's off, like blood pressure's too high and stuff not like tonight. that. It's not worth it because I can sleep at night. Yeah, and then you know how am I going to explain to your family like I'm sorry, you know, I pushed through. Even though I should, no, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not doing that. Yeah, no, I'm not. Not when it's like optional. Exactly, it's cosmetic. Exactly. Now I'm in here trying to save their life, you know, for some type of heart, like a cardiothoracic yeah. surgeon. Then you know we talk about that kind of stuff. Right. I'm, I am a aesthetic plastic surgeon at this point. Nah. Yeah. You know, it's not worth it. It's, <laughs> it's not, not worth, worth the it. stress. Not worth. So what's next for you? I mean, do you plan on being like five plus surgeries a day for the next 20 years? I love plastic surgery, but I have other career goals that I want to look into. Like I'm really big on mentoring and giving back. So I just started my foundation. I really started filing the paperwork in July, the mm. Dr. Wilson Triggs Foundation. So I'm be working with any, you know, underprivileged kids in education, providing financial literacy. Sponsor. I thought you were going to say medical care, but. <laughs> well, you know, just anything educational based okay. um, to get them exposure. And, you know, because I don't even care if you want to uh, want to become a doctor. I just want you to get an education yeah. and, um, you know, learn more and be exposed to things that you might not have been exposed to. Love it. Um, so I'm really, really big into that. So I'm getting that off the ground. And I think that's probably what I'm going to move into more full time in the next like 10 to 15 years. It's really like growing that. And then also sponsoring other organizations, nonprofits mm -hmm. that deal with that same type of uh, scope. So you want to work with kids and get them earlier involved in their own personal finances. Exactly. Personal finances and just education in general. Okay. Yeah. Programs, grants. Yep. How are you thinking? Mostly for me, it's probably going to be from a grant scholarship uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I'll target other uh, nonprofits that actually do the hands-on work, mm -hmm. you know, that mm -hmm. are like taking them in the field and giving them ACT, ACT mm -hmm. prep. I like like I work with uh, a nonprofit in Tampa when I was in uh, residence and even now I know the 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 owners um, the the CEO mm -hmm. and uh, it's called G3 life applications and they're ch trying to start a charter school and mm. things like that so I want to be involved so like let me help try to raise monies to help these type of programs yeah that's where my strong suit is outside of like actually doing like little career days and talking about medicine and stuff like that I feel like I can have a bigger range in doing that and providing monies and things like that philanthropist that's the move that's the move for Miami me. surgeon I know Miami hot boy surgeon to well, you added the hot boy not me <laughs> I'm just going off what they tell me <laughs> to philanthropist yes. foundation extraordinaire that's, that's I love it. that for you but you got to make a lot of money to live that life yeah do you have a number I do have a number we're what's getting your there. number my, we have a number we're getting there like, we got 
if if everything is uh is stays on course is it five, assets? five to eight years. Is it assets that you want? Or is um, it like No, actual... I have I have a I have an actual number and amount of assets that I want. So like mm. once I hit that, because most most of my assets are are equities, well, stocks, bonds, and things like that. Right. So once I get a certain number amount of equity, then you know, I, of course I draw credit lines and stuff like that. Yeah. That's when I'm probably gonna step down from plastic surgery and softball entropy. And, and if things stay on track as they are now, the it's five years, five to eight years. Wow. That's soon. Yeah. That's very soon. Yeah. I think you're gonna get bored. You I don't think so? that's enough. You don't think so? No, no. I feel like there's other ventures. Like, you know, I'm building I, I wanna like dive into like real estate, commercial real estate, okay. things like that. I'm actually studying to take the securities exam. I feel like really? if, if yes, I feel like if most of my money is in equities. Like I should know what the stock brokers know, so why not take the test? I love so that. I've been studying. You're clearly for that. a good test taker. Yeah, because you made it yeah. through all these different things. Yeah, so in my free time, that's that's what I've been doing. I've been studying for that, and then I'll probably take the series seven. And, oh wow! And yeah, we'll see. We'll see where we go from there. Interesting. The reason I asked, one I already knew, because yeah, yeah. the answer, y'all know I do my research before <laughs> these interviews. But the reason I ask is because a lot of times on this podcast, we talk about people's journey and typically people get to this point at some point where they're like, and I'm done with that. Like, mm -hmm. even if you've already sunk cost of med school, residency, right. building your brand, building your career, building your portfolio as a surgeon, you're still like, when I'm 60, being a surgeon may not even be a part of my identity at all. Right. Right. Exactly. And I think that's really scary for a lot of people. People feel like they're alone in that. But actually, the majority of people I speak to have that vision for themselves. Yeah. And then I think physicians in general, the burnout is real. You're hearing mm. a lot, especially in COVID. And luckily, I wasn't one of those specialties that really got slammed like that. Yeah. But a lot of physicians burn out. And, you know, you hear about physician suicide. It's and terrible. And because of like the medical legal realm now with the different health departments cracking down on stuff, physicians are just tired. You know, you're doing more paperwork than you are providing care, mm. you know, and I'm not going to burn out. I'm not doing that. You're like, I'm not yeah, before that my, happens. I have two children that I love spending time with. You know, the money will come. I will figure it out. Yeah. And I have other passions. When I tell people that at some point I won't be CEO of Blavity, they like can't understand what I'm saying. Right. I'm like, no, there will be a point where yeah. it like doesn't make sense for the world for me to be the ceo and it right. doesn't make sense for me and right. it, you know yes there's savants like a steve jobs or a bob Iger or mark mm -hmm. zuckerberg or yep. people who like start when they're 20 and go all the way right. but i think the majority of people would prefer if they had a choice to live a different life they would for sure like after sure. you've accomplished what you wanted to accomplish. Now, i was one of those people like why would you do that now i'm kind of like oh i see why now like yeah i'm get to this point yeah move on to the next thing I think that's really interesting yeah. and hopefully encouraging other people to feel a little bit more free. It's like, who cares that you sunk all this time when you were in your 20s? Like, exactly. it's done. <laughs> exactly. It was a great experience, you yeah. know, studying late night, making great friends, yeah. like the anxiety of test taking and things like that. Okay, I've done that. That's cool. Okay, Dr. Treggs, for anyone who's looking to book a consultation, although from my perspective, I'm like, y'all got a free consultation. <laughs> so respect this man's time. But other than that, for their personal, personalized consultation, gotcha. where can people find you? How do they reach out to you? Right. Let's start there. Yeah. So I provide my services to Vixen Plastic Surgery in Miami and Coral Gables at Dr. Triggs Miami. That's my like business page for plastic surgery. And then at Vixen Plastic Surgery, both are on Instagram and we have a website, www.vixenplasticsurgery.com. That's where they can click the link or call for their free consultation. Okay. And can they request you specifically? Definitely. Okay. And how far in advance, if they're like, I want surgery in three months, how far in advance should they get a consultation? I would say if you have like a goal, like a weight loss goal, and you still haven't met there, I'll do the consultation at any point. Okay. But if you haven't like reached a certain BMI or you still got things going on, we're going to have to like redo the consultation because your body may have changed a lot. Okay. And so I'll do the consultation at any point just so you can get the information that you need and mm -hmm. make the decision you need to. That can happen anytime, but if we got surgery coming up, probably within a month, 30 days. Oh, so someone could book you and they could be on your schedule in 30 mm -hmm. days? Yeah. I heard that you had a wait list and people was getting pushed out to two, three months. Some, sometimes, sometimes. <laughs> but well, I'll put it like this. The consultation wise is easy. Now the actual booking of surgery, that's where we kind of finagle because I do okay. have some blackout dates and stuff like yeah. that for family stuff or whatever. So yeah, there's a wait list for that. But like, for actual consultations, yeah, yeah. For consultations though, 
you know, you can do those kind of like anytime. It's like the actual surgery schedule is the surgery schedule. I think we're like at three months or something right now. Yeah. 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 Like, <laughs> let me be clear. Right. But they say, well, Morgan said, Wilton, thank you so much for joining us today. This was very entertaining and interesting to me. Hopefully it was interesting to all of you. Yeah, man, I had a blast. Small town boy from Alabama out here. Out here. Out here. <laughs> Thanks for listening to The Journey Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you leave a review and head to our Instagram and YouTube to leave a comment. I look forward to hearing how this podcast has made an impact on your own journey.